Hi, everyone. Apologies, I'm a couple minutes behind. I realized at the last minute that I didn't have my microphone plugged in <laughs> because I also use it for recording the audio for my regular videos, and I use actually a different device for that. So the last minute I went, uh-oh, I don't have audio. <laughs> I better get that. So hopefully you all can hear me um, now, and it's working okay. I see a bunch of you already here. Um, hi, Rob. Glad to hear you're, you're looking forward to this one. And hi, Uni, Carrie Ann, who's from Ottawa, Canada. Cool. Celtic Tiger, um, Carlos Eduardo. Hi, everyone. So um, I, I do know where a bunch of you are from already because you guys have told me before, but um, not everybody necessarily knows, and a bunch of people have just hopped on as well. So hi, Florin. Uh, so when you get a chance, let me know in the chat where you all are are tuning in from tonight. I know some of you are in Europe, so it's evening there. Uh, it's the afternoon here in the States where I am. Um, hmm. YouTube is telling me that there's a little bit of stream health issues. So I'm hoping y'all can do everything okay from here. I haven't usually, I don't really haven't had any problems before. So hopefully it's all right. Oh, wow. So I'm uh, Joanna or I'm not sure, you probably pronounce that differently than, than we do in English since you're from Chile. Let's see. And Paul from Alabama and Celtic Tiger, of course, as the name suggests, Ireland. Um, hi, Sahad. Uh, Alaya, is that how you pronounce it? From California. Rob's in Houston. Hi, Richard. Uh, uh, Sahad's in Washington State. We've got people coast to coast and on at least three different continents, probably four, I'm guessing, from some of the people who haven't mentioned where they are yet. Um, so we'll see as people go. Yeah, and Florence in Romania. Elias says yes, so hopefully that means I'm pronouncing your name correctly. <laughs> um, Joanna says it's all right, all right. Because I'm just guessing in Chile you would not pronounce the J like that. Um, since it usually isn't in, in any other words in Spanish and so forth. All right, so... Um, as you all probably noticed, I, I teased you guys a bit with um, the cartouche of Nefertiti on this one to introduce the topic I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about today because I've gotten a lot of questions about this because I have shown her cartouche in a couple of videos. Um, and sometimes similar groupings of hieroglyphs also show up in other things that I've shown. So I thought, you know, I've been answering in the comments and such, but I thought it would be a good idea to actually dive into it here. And... Um, I don't think that'll take too long. Once we're done with that, you know, we can just kind of have a free for all Q and A for a little bit um, before we wrap up. So, with that, let me go ahead and switch to sharing. I actually prepared some slides this time, so <laughs> I can show you some of this stuff. Um, so I know, like the first time I did a live, it was super last minute, and so I didn't have any, I didn't have any illustrations ready or anything like that. But I did get some this time, so. Um, so this is the cartouche, of course, that I showed you before. And a lot of people have asked me, because I showed this, I think, I think I showed this when I did the video on Nefer, which is, of course, uh, this sign here is Nefer. And uh, a lot of people said, well, wait, why are there four of them <laughs> in here? And we're actually five, wait, there's another on the, on the next line. So um, that's what I wanted to dive into here. But to get before I get into specifically Nefertiti's cartouche, I have to back up for a moment and get into what it means when you have a group of three signs in Egyptian. So this is something I talked about in my weekly email today. For those of you on my email list, you've already seen a little bit of this. Um, and if you're not on my email list, you can always, um, excuse me, join and also get my free guide if you go to voicesofancientegypt.com slash guide. Uh, and then I send out a weekly email on Tuesdays that always has uh, some different tidbits, everything from online resources, like like their newly redone British Museum catalog that's online I talked about last week, um, to 
different things about hieroglyphs that may not may or may not show up in some of the videos. So you're welcome, of course, to join me there. So the first thing to mention is that before I actually get into some examples, it in, is that in Egyptian, unlike English, there are actually um, three different ways to do number. So in English, for example, we have a singular, like I might say a book or land or a piece of land or something like that. That's one, that's a singular. Or I might say books or lands, that's plural. So anything that's two or more, I would say lands for, right? So Egyptian does have a singular and a plural, but they also have what's called a dual. So if you have two of something, that's actually a different ending. So in English, for example, anything that's more than one, we usually use, there are some exceptions because English is a very irregular language, but we usually use an S to make that plural, right? So if I say land, lands or five lands or 10 books or whatever, we have that same S ending in all those cases. So Egyptian's a little different. If you have two of something, particularly things that typically come in pairs, so like if you're talking about hands, for example, they're gonna use the dual for that, if, or legs, ears, eyes, you know, body parts that come in pairs are really common things that they talk about in the dual. Um, but they sometimes do it with some other things as well, like land. So for example, one of the nicknames for Egypt is the two lands. And so they use a dual ending to the word land to write that um, because it's a very standardized way of thinking of Egypt. They don't necessarily always use the dual when they're talking about two of something, if it's something that doesn't typically come in a pair, but they do a lot of times. So let me just get into a little bit of the basics of how you do this in Egyptian. So on the screen, I've got a, an example of um, four different words here. So top left, I don't know, some of you might know um, enough of some, especially some of the one consonant signs to be able to sign this, sound this out. Any of you know how to um, sound out that first word in the, in the top left? The bottom ones are probably a little harder because it's a little less common sign. But uh, let me know in the chat if, you, I can, if you're familiar with the sounds of those signs and then we'll get into in just a moment what the difference is between the one on the left versus the one on the right there's just one small difference as you can see here so let's see carlos says opid yes that's how i would pronounce it is is opid of course there's no actual e written in it but that's how we would say it um yusuf says uh a a p d s yeah you've got it it is a p d and there's no S on it, but I'm guessing maybe you've added the S for um, the English plural on the end, maybe. Um, hi, Renee. Renee says bonjour. Uh, and yeah, so this is opid. So in transliteration, we would do this like this. This is an aleph. This is how we, how we write that. Then we have the next sign on top of the hand. That box is a P. Then the hand is a D. And then this... Um, Goose, I guess it is. I always forget which ones are ducks and which ones are gooses. Um, is what's called a determinative. So this is kind of a vague categorizing kind of sign that goes with this. So apid is a word for bird. In English, we, and in most of uh, modern languages, we pronounce this as apid. Although, of course, as I've mentioned in many of my videos, there's no vowel here. We're just adding in the e. Eh to make it make sense in some, as something you can say aloud. So yes, Mahmoud, we're talking about singular versus plural. Hi, P, welcome, and hi, Jihad. Glad to see you could join us. And Joanna points out, yes, that the three strokes indicates plural. That's right, I'll get into that in a moment. So the one on the left is bird, and the one on the right is birds, plural. So written basically the same way. Oh, hi, Mahmoud, tuning in from the Fayum. In Egypt, cool. Uh, so we still have apid right here and the same determinative, but then the three plural strokes, we call these plural strokes because they indicate the plural. When you have three strokes like this, you, this indicates that you're dealing with a plural word. So for a masculine word like apid, the plural ending is a W. That would be the, the sound value for the plural. 
And sometimes they do include the quail chick, that's that actual W, or a curly Q, which can also be a W, to make it fully explicit that we have a W sound sound there. <laughs> but um, sometimes, or actually I would say most of the time, they just use the plural strokes and expect you to basically know that the W should be there. Um, and this is actually a common thing in Egyptian that drives my students crazy is that they also just leave off Ws a lot on the ends of words. Um, same thing with the, um, with the reed leaf yod gets left off a lot. So yes, that's right, Carlos. So, uh, so it's like Abadu is how I would probably say that aloud. And again, just a modern convention of pronunciation, not actually how the Egyptians would do it. So I don't know if anybody will know the sign that I've used in the word below. It's, um, it's one that's somewhat common in Egyptian, but it really shows up mainly in just one main context. So if you haven't learned it in that context, you won't have actually seen it before. Um, Ashraf, yeah, like I assume you're talking about Abydos, probably, right? Um, which is in um, the southern half of Egypt in um, Sohag. So, or, or Sohaj, depending on where you live and how you want to pronounce that. Um, yeah, so a lot of people are putting in here Renpat, um, or it's, it's used for regnal year. Yeah, it's actually just year in this case. So you, there's a second sign that we usually add on to make it regnal year. But um, hi, Dakota. Glad to see you joining us. So yeah, this first sign is is Renap. And then we have a T. So Renpet. And then we have a little dash that's sort of a combination of um, space filler and determinative because the little dash, sometimes they use it just to fill space. Sometimes they use it also to let you know if there's a word that could be written with one sign that that one sign is basically the whole word. So hi, Mark, glad you could join us. So that's Renpet, which is the word for year, as, as some of you already said. I should probably write birds over here. I didn't write that. You all got to have a good sample of my awful handwriting, which is even worse when writing on an iPad screen like this. So then we have the plural version, of course, on the right, as you might have guessed, if you didn't know it already, that the um, plural strokes there, of course, are going to give us a plural. Now, Renpet, though, it ends in a T. So if you are a little familiar with Egyptian and or if you've seen my video on the T, you'll know this is a feminine ending. So Renpet's a feminine word. So the plural acts a little bit differently. It does involve adding a W. But in this case, we actually add the W before the T. Um, and again, sometimes they do write this out explicitly by adding the quail chick W in there, but a lot of times they leave it out and just use the plural strokes. So this is something if, if, you, if you know Arabic or Hebrew, for example, this is going to be already a pretty familiar pattern. It's very similar in those languages and other Semitic languages as well. So yeah, I would pronounce that um, renput, just to, again, modern convenience for years. Um, yes, Mahmoud was just pointing out that uh, Abidos in Egyptian is Abju. That's, that is true. Yes, Renput. So um, that's the difference between the singular and the plural. Um, now, I mentioned there's also a dual, and there's also a couple different ways you can do the plural. Like this is the more standard way you could do a pl plural. But there are some other ways as well. And let me show you just one example also on an actual artifact because these are my typed hieroglyphs, which are nice and clear, but it's nice to also see an actual Egyptian example as well. So if we zoom in on this particular offering table, which is um, in the Metropolitan Museum, I don't have the number offhand, but if you guys wanna know what the inventory number is, I can pop it in the description later. Um, and I just didn't have time to gather them right before this. So one example would be right here. And this one, right? So we have this sign, which I have talked about in one of my videos before. One of the first ones I did, I believe, which is Hetep. It's one of my favorites because of its incredible circularness with the shape of offering tables, which is also the shape of the sign with an, an offering table with a bread loaf on it. So this spells out Hetep, which can be um, offering to offer or to be satisfied, which of course is related to the idea of receiving offerings, so all related meanings. Um, and then when we have the plural strokes, as you might guess, like we saw before, we have hetapu. 
So this could be offerings. In this particular case, it is offerings. There are sometimes some other ways this could be interpreted, but in this particular case, we're definitely talking about offerings because we're talking about giving this person offerings and provisions and all offerings and provisions, blah, blah, blah. So just write that out for y'all. Offerings. All right. Now, another way they can be written, though, sometimes, this applies really only to when you have a sign that writes out a whole word by itself. So nefer is one of these, like uh, I showed you at the very beginning. Um, this is ta, which is the sign that spells the word for land. So when you're doing the singular, sometimes they write just that land sign. Sometimes they have these two determinatives with it. It varies. Um, they don't always include determinatives, particularly for certain words. So this would be, as I just indicated up there, we would transliterate this as T Aleph. So modern English speakers pronounce this as Ta. And this just means land or a land, singular. There's no um, what you would technically call articles in Middle Egyptian. So there's no A or the. So if we're translating into English, we need to provide that in the context where you need one in English. Um, yes, and Joanna's already hopping ahead to the duel here um, with Tawi. So we have Ta's land, as you would guess. For plural, it's Ta'u. And this is another way that you can make the plural. If you have a sign that's the whole word all by itself, like Ta, you can just put three of them together and have that make the plural. So you get this with um, ta is a common one where this happens. Nefer is another one where that happens a lot. So if you three, see three nefer signs together, it's neferu, for example. And then we also, of course, have the more common, as I talked about briefly before, tawi, as some of you are already talking about in the chat. Because we is the dual ending, W-Y. Um, so if you have two lands, that's tawi. You can also write this out phonetically by using a quail chick and double reed leaf and or also by using two dashes, just like how we did with the plural with three dashes. So um, yeah, so Celtic Tires asking about three thrones, same idea. So um, the word for throne is set. It's a, it's a feminine word. So if it became plural, it would technically be suit if you have three thrones. So same kind of thing. Um, so, and I was, I have to admit, I was in a little bit of a rush before this and I didn't get the example I wanted for you all of um, a footstool, but I'll see if I can pull it up in a browser and show you guys briefly in a minute because I don't have it right here in my slides. But I wanted to show you guys um, the two lands in action here. So, um, this is the bottom of a scarab seal. So like the other side of this looks like a scarab beetle. It's rounded and so forth. And the bottom has this inscription carved into it. So I don't know if anybody actually used this to make seal impressions, but a lot of times that's how these were used, is you would actually use the bottom of this to press into clay and, and make a mark with it. But in this case, this has the name of the female pharaoh, Hatshepsut, which is Ma'at. That's right here which is one I have on my list of, of things to do in a video coming up. Um, ka, Ray. So this is Ka. And of course, the, the probably, um, if you know what Ray means, then you probably can guess that the sun disk there is Ray. Um, yeah, Dakota, you've been to Daryl Bakri. It's a, it's a wonderful place. So... We have Ma'at Kare. In English, we'd transcribe that like this. Either an E or an A on the end, it, it's basically the same because, again, it's not a vowel in Egyptian, it's an Ein. So, um, P asking if the two lands expresses, um, yeah, the two, to the two lands north and south. That's correct. So, and then over here, we have Neb on the left hand side, this basket, which is one I have a video on you all want to see it. And then we have the two land signs. So Tawi. And this means Lord. There's two different words that spelled Neb, but 
in this case, whenever you see it with Tawi, you know it's this particular one, which is Lord. Of the two lands. Now, again, in Egyptian, there's no the, so in English we supply that. And they do have a version of that, what's technically called the genitive, the of. And sometimes they use it, but they also very often don't. And you can make this construction just by two, putting two nouns together. You can have the same thing of having that kind of of. So, um, so what's the feminine of Lord? That would be nebet. So again, you add the T on the end. But Hatshepsut, much of the time, goes by um, masculine, uh, what we call epithets. This is what we call an epithet. Basically, a really formulaic descriptive phrase um, is what an epithet is. So Nebtawi is one of those. Um, I don't recall if she does call herself Nebtawi sometimes. I think so. But that's something I can't remember off the top of my head. So yeah, Nebet is often translated as lady. It's just a it's just the feminine equivalent of neb. So both of them can mean um, mean it in the sense of a ruler, like somebody who rules over something, but it can also mean in the sense of somebody who owns something. So you could be the lord or lady of an estate, for example, um, and it doesn't mean necessarily that you're like ruling over a country or something like that, but it really just means like you're the, you're the head person on that estate, you own it, that kind of thing. So it, it's used in both of those kinds of contexts. So one of the interesting things um, about the fact that you have the singular, the dual, and the plural is that three holds a kind of special place as being a plural in terms of numbers. And then even going beyond that, um, here's the, the image that I meant to pull up for you guys and forgot. I had it in my email today. So I'll have to pull it up on my screen and show you guys, um, is the importance of the number nine. So of course, three times three, is nine. And because of that, nine is kind of like an ultimate plural in Egyptian, um, not just in terms of numbers, but in culturally. A group of nine of something is kind of like saying basically everything or all of those things. So um, let me see if I can pull up that example that I wanted to um, show you all. I had, uh, I stuck it in my email this morning, but then forgot to stick it in the slides as well. So let's see. Go ahead and just pull it up from there. No, oh, shoot, doesn't want to enlarge, but anyway, okay, let me. <laughs> Pull it up from the folder instead. Apologies for the delay on that. So one of the things is that I'm trying to show you is that nine of things shows up in the art a lot. So if you see groups of nine, that lets you know that they're basically trying to encompass all of whatever that is. Um, so see um, I'm gonna add this in here for you okay <laughs> so got my um, just my little photo app over in here for you um, so you can see so this is a photo um, by, let me make sure I credit the photographer here. Pull up the thing. So, um, by a man named Louis Brems of Tutankhamun's throne, one of his thrones, and footstool. So, if you take a look at the footstool, you might notice there's some people on it. You see how many? Count them up and think about it a minute. Um, so, these are sort of stereotypical representations of foreign enemies of Egypt. So some of them look uh, sort of stereotypically Nubian. Some of them look stereotypically Near Eastern. And they're all shown with their arms tied behind their backs. This is a really common motif for Egyptians to show foreigners as basically like bound captives. So um, did y'all count them up yet? <laughs> yeah, we've got nine. So, I mean, in a lot of ways, this is not typical of Egyptian art in that it's asymmetrical, right? 
Egyptian art tends to be very symmetrical. They like to have, um, you know, even sides to things. But in this case, you have five on the right-hand side and four on the left-hand side. So you actually have a total of nine. Again, this is, again, nine being that sort of plural of plurals. It means these are all of Egypt's enemies encompassed in these nine. And um, to take this a step further, kind of related to my last slide I did where I talked about magic, is that this is also functioning in a way of what we could call sympathetic magic in that when the king sits down here, he's putting his feet right on top of those bound prisoners. So he's trampling all of the foreign enemies of Egypt who could possibly threaten Egypt. So in addition to it just being a, a handy way to represent all of them, it's also functioning in a kind of protective magic for Egypt um, and warding off the potential enemies that could cause trouble. So it's a take a look next time you're in a museum or even just scrolling Instagram or something and see how often you can notice there are nine of things. It's not always that way, but you'll see it sometimes. Um, if they want to show mm, ears, for example, that are supposed to be the God's ears that can hear you, oftentimes they'll show nine of them. Uh, if you see foreign enemies, oftentimes they'll show nine like this. All right. So... Now that we've established that, I can go back to um, showing you that cartouche, which is the original thing I kind of teased you all about, right? Um, let me turn off the photo. There we go. And oops, got to move this back over because it got moved while I was showing the photo. All right. So in terms of Nefertiti's cartouche, well, Part of the reason why we have so many Nefers is we actually have two names here, um, two names of hers. So the bottom section here, starting below this line, is the name that you're going to be more familiar with, and it reads from right to left. So I've talked a bit of, I have a video about direction of reading, um, and you can check that out more. But basically, the basics of it here are depending on which direction the signs are facing. So you'll notice a seated woman at the, at the bottom, for example, is facing towards the right, the reed leaf with the two legs facing towards the right, um, and that means we're going to start reading on the right. So we start with the nefer. T, and then the, the double strokes is a, is a Y. And then we have um, E, which means to come. That's the reed leaf with the walking legs. And then down here, the whatever, the, I don't even know what that's supposed to be that looks kind of like a really long teardrop, is um, T. So this is how you get, in English, we say Nefertiti. The seated woman, of course, is a determinative. Um, and this uh, literally means the, the beautiful one is come. So again, Nefer means beautiful or good or perfect. So you could also say the good, the good one has come. So Neferet with a T is the feminine version. So she is the feminine good one who has come. Um, and then E means to come, and it's in this form that is often called the stative or the old perfective, depending on whose grammar you're using, um, which basically just means that somebody is in the state of having completed an action. Um, so, and Dakota says, so she's super pretty, right? Because Nefer, we have the plural, plus then we have Nefer with the two strokes. Yeah, in this case, um, the two strokes is, is doing something different. It's not, the, it's not the dual in this particular case, but it's the, it's the Y sound there. So then her other name, though, it does involve beauty. And there's a couple ways you could interpret the meaning of the other name. So for one thing, you'll notice the top half, um, well, it's a little harder to tell. But if you look at the reed leaf, notice it's actually facing the other way. And that's uh, an interesting thing that for whatever reason they do with her names, where the one name faces one way, so you read it in one direction, and the other name faces the other way. So we're actually going to start on the left-hand side with this one. But we also have a little something else going on here, which is this first part here is the name of the god Aten, or in Egyptian this is just I-T-N. And this is a form of the sun gods. This is why we have the sun determinative there. That, of course, is the aspect of the sun god that um, Akhenaten favored in particular, and Nefertiti being his chief wife. So 
Otten features in the names a lot of the royal family. But something's going on here where we don't actually read Otten first. And that's because this is a practice called honorific transposition, which is when you name a god in a phrase and, and names. This showed up in um, Hatshepsut's name before also, but I kind of glossed over it. Um, is that they actually front the god's name in the writing. Although grammatically speaking, it doesn't actually make sense there. Um, so we're actually going to read it after the Nefer signs. So how we're going to read the Nefer signs is that we actually have, we first have one Nefer by itself, and then we have three Nefers. And as we've seen before, if you put three together, that's going to be Neferu. And then we have Aten. So if we want to put some dashes in here to distinguish the parts of the name, just so you can kind of see, tell them apart, you have Nefer, Neferu, Aten. So this is her other name. And the Amarna period is kind of a, a big mess in terms of rulers. And there's she's not the only one who takes on this name. But I won't, I'm not going to get into that because it's not something I have delved deeply into recently. But um, this is her name. So a, lo a lot of people interpret this as um, beautiful is the beauty of of the Aten. Um, so you could do that. Mean Nefer being the beautiful. Then Neferu, it can mean multiple beautiful people or beautiful ones, but it can also be used as a general noun meaning beauty, perfection, splendor, that kind of thing. So some people interpret it as beautiful um, is the beauty of Aten. Now, you could also argue, though, that this is describing, instead of describing the Aten, that this is describing Nefertiti herself. Um, but the problem with that is that the Nefer here does not have a T on it. And if it was describing Nefertiti, you would expect it to have a T, just like it does in her other name. Because you could interpret this as the beautiful, beautiful one of the beautiful ones, Right, so singular and then plural, which is how Egyptians actually would say somebody is the most beautiful. That's how they would write it. But in this case, we only have masculine words. We don't have feminine ones, so it wouldn't really make sense to describe Nefertiti um, with the masculine versions and say that. So I'm sure you could still make an argument for it and argue they left the T's off or something like that, but um, it is a little bit um, problematic with that. Um, yeah, so some of you are saying that, like, about her being the most beautiful, that, that is one possible interpretation, but then we have the problem of not having the, the, uh, feminine ending. So most people would go, I think, with the beautiful is the beauty of Aten, and it's really describing the god rather than her in this particular name. All right. So I'm, I'm open to any other questions y'all have for me. I can stick around for a little bit longer, um... Um, uh, Louis, oh yeah, that's interesting. I didn't, didn't know that about the word for jade in Greek. Um, so yeah, if you guys have any other questions, it doesn't have to be about this. Like, like the time when I did a Q and A a couple weeks ago and you guys just kind of like randomly threw out questions at me and I answered the best that I've had off the top of my head. We can do some more of that today. Um, if you like, so, um, let me know. Unfortunately, I can't read languages and written in Cyrillic so I, I can't tell what your what your comment says Nikita but thanks for joining us today um so I'll um throw it out to you guys in case you have any uh, other questions for me today I'm trying to think if there was something else that I talked about recently that you guys had asked me a bunch of questions about um ah asked me about the two strokes in um in Nefertiti's, oh, I see, after the T, you mean? Um, in Nefertiti's name. Yeah, I think that's, usually people interpret that as being just this, a sound sort of complement going with the, um, with the walking reed leaf over here, which is also the E. So the two strokes is another way of writing the, um, the tool, the two reed leaves. 
So it's a shorthand for writing two reed leaves. So you know how when you have one reed leaf, that's like one eye, and this is this is why I don't usually draw my glyphs, because as you can see, it's pretty, it's even worse on a slippery screen <laughs> than usual, but it's pretty, uh, pretty sorry that that's my, uh, my reed leaves. But it's the same thing when you have the double strokes. It's the same thing as, as um, a double reed leaf. And interestingly enough, like the, the curly Q that can also be a W, both of these are things that um, this is how they wrote these signs in hieratic, the cursive form of writing that they wrote for every day. And then these forms actually made their way back into hieroglyphs from hieratic. And so when two dashes will fit better than two reed leaves, that's usually when they use them. So let's see, we've got some other questions. Um, let's see. Carlos asked me about why they didn't venture into the Mediterranean. I have to say that's not exactly my specialty, but I mean, they did travel along the coast, some like to the Near East and to Byblos um, in what would now be Lebanon, for example, uh, but they didn't tend to go across the open water. Um, how much of that had to do with ship technology? How much of that had to do with the people living on the other side? I'm not sure, but um, they did do some faring along the coast in the in the Mediterranean. Why he wants to know why there's so many birds and hieroglyphs? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I guess just because there were a lot of different species of birds that they could draw on for that, um, just like other things in their environment. So there are a lot of animals in general in hieroglyphs. Um, there are a ton of birds, I have to admit, like more than reptiles or um, other categories of animals, maybe. Well, maybe not more than other than, maybe not more than mammals, but um, it, there is an awful lot. Um, I think it's just because they were, things that were readily available for sounds and or determinatives that they needed. Uh, yeah, Jihad's asking about the direction of the reed leaf. Yes, if it's facing like the, technically it's not really a leaf, but it's a, it's the like flowery, fluffy top of a reed. So if the fluffy stuff is, whatever direction the fluffy stuff is facing is usually the, the beginning of the, of the line. Um, yeah, Dakota saying, yeah, two strokes is for the, is for the double reed leaf. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> P, yes, yes, certainly Hannibal did. Of course, that's, you know, different part of North Africa, different and different time period. Um, Nikita saying depot for, I assume for boat. <laughs> yep. That is one of the Egyptian words for boat. It's sort of the more generic word for boat. It's, uh, there are like so many different words for boats. So in Egyptian, as you can imagine, because traveling by boat up and down the Nile was a huge part of the everyday life and culture. So there are a bunch of different words for them. Um, two discs beside a quail chick and a water sign under it. Not sure what that one is, Celtic Tiger. You'd have to show me a, a picture. Um, so maybe we can tackle that one at a later time if you send me a photo or something. I can I can look at it. Um, Yusuf asking about how to distinguish between what an olive and an ein. Is that what you're asking? Um, I'm not sure. So tell me if that's what if that's what you're asking, Yusuf. I'm sorry, my Arabic is really uh, atrocious and not been in practice for a good many years now. Um, I used to be able to at least do some basic, you know, can get myself around in Egypt Arabic, but it's it's pretty super rusty at this point because um, I just haven't used it much in a while. Dakota, yeah, that's true. It's really not about her. Well. The Nefertiti part it is about her being, it says a beautiful one has come, so, and a feminine beautiful one, so it is talking about her, but um, not the other name, yeah. Oh, hi, Sakina, glad you could join us. I know it must be pretty late where you are. Um, yeah, Dakota, yeah, the Nefer Neferu Aten is really about um, the Aten's beauty. So... Oh, Mahmoud's asking about the the uh, the supposed placenta, third H. Yeah, so third H, um, oh, maybe, are you asking between like the third H and the fourth H? Is that what you're actually asking about? Or, or, so a third H is like, like a ha, like a bit of a guttural. 
sound. The oh, so you're asking about the r ein. Oh, like we usually pronounce it as re, but it's um, the ein would be more like an ein in Arabic. So like an ein, which you know is my English speaker attempt at an ein. Um, so and then the the r is pretty similar. Also, probably to the Arabic R more than the English R. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I can't remember what that is in Coptic. I want to say it's like, uh, we, I think, I want to say in Coptic it's like Riyahu or something like that. But I, I can't recall now off the top of my head, which gives us a little bit better idea of how it would have actually been pronounced rather than Ray. Right. Um, but, uh, Oh, I see. Yusuf asking about the sun disk versus the placenta. Yeah, so they are very often shown without the details in the, the center. And we don't know if that third H is even a placenta. Like I talked about in my video yesterday, it's like, it's one of the more mysterious signs. It's, what is it? A ball of string? A placenta? Like, I mean, I don't know. All the medical people I know go, that doesn't look like a placenta. Um, so a basket, a bread loaf, these are different interpretations. But um, yeah, a lot of times you just have to tell from context in terms of which one you have. Now, sometimes they would have actually painted in the details and the paint has faded away, and that's why we can't tell for if it's carved in stone, for example. Um, but the, um, the way you tell them apart is really context. So uh, people are talking about Ankh in the chat, so that would be one example. Like, again, I'm going to give you my, my horrible writing on an iPad um, <laughs> hieroglyphs here. But if you had something like this, all right, um, you could interpret this as onk, n, ray. But most likely, it's actually probably just the word onk with two what we call phonetic complements. So this sign all by itself is already onk or onk, and then. Oftentimes what they like to do when they have a sign that has three sounds in it, or even some with two as well, is they'll repeat the last sign, the sound rather. I always mix up the words sign and sound. They, they repeat the last sound or sometimes the last two sounds. So in this case, they're repeating the N and the third H. It's a phonetic complement. So this is an example of context where it just is pretty clear that this is going to be a third H that they're talking about. And this is just the word long. Um, you know, likewise, if you see at the end of a king's name where it might have this or, you know, really this first and then this, let me put this in a little box here separate from those reed leaves. So this has got a little bit of honorific transposition going on again here. So we actually read the, the, um, the mace or the rattle looking thing first. And this is me, am I, or am yod, really. And then we read the ray after that. And this is super formulaic, and it's some, a way of describing a king that means like ray. In other words, he's like the sun god. Um, so again, this is one that from context, we know that's what it is, rather than going to, it's not going to be like mich, because I don't think there is any word in Egyptian that's mich. <laughs> um, and me ray is a super common formulaic thing so that clues us in on it um so let's see oh sakina i see you didn't have wi-fi where you were well i'm glad you've joined us now and you can always catch the rest um on the replay a little bit later um doo -doo -doo. yeah mahmoud's agreeing that it doesn't look like a placenta yeah, I would agree. Um, Amoa, I have not heard that of that interpretation of the ankh. I think, you know, a lot of people interpret it as a, as a sandal strap, which is a possibility, but we don't know for certain necessarily um, what the actual picture was originally. Um, we just know that it represents the sounds that are in the word onk, the ein, n, and third h. Um, okay, yeah, Yusuf. I'm glad that made sense for you. All right. Um, 
I'm going to have to wrap it up uh, with that, guys, but I anticipate being back with another live next week. So if you have further questions, you can feel free to, of course, like email them to me or save them up for the next live um, or whatever. And I will uh, see you guys soon. Thanks so much for joining me. I saw a really good number of you. Many of you I recognize, of course, because you come to the the premieres and the other lives and stuff. And I saw a couple people who I think um, I hadn't seen before. Uh, so welcome to all of you. Very happy to have you, and thanks so much for joining me. It was fun chatting with you today. So with that, I'm going to say take care, and I will see you again soon.